Yeah, to, to me, money has always been a means to accomplish things that you can't otherwise. Um, it's, it's fuel for your car to go farther and do more things. It's not the, uh, the driver. Hi, everybody. We're here on the Founder Hour podcast. Today, we're joined by Ryan Hudson, who is the co-founder of Honey, a software company in Los Angeles, which we'll be talking more about on this podcast. So, Ryan, to kick off the episode, why don't you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Sure. Yeah, I was uh, grew up in the uh, the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. Um, my parents were automotive uh, marketer and uh, emergency room doctor. And I learned at a very early age uh, from my mom, seeing her go through medical school while I was a child, that I did not want to be a doctor. Um, but I wanted to do high-impact things that could make the world a better place. And I grew up in the, uh, the 90s and kind of saw the original dot-com boom and uh, saw that it was possible for people to make things that actually changed the course of how the world worked. And that was pretty appealing to me. And so I was always pulled toward the, the intersection of business and technology and solving problems for people in the real world. Knowing that you didn't want to pursue medicine and you wanted to do this, you know, this you want to be involved with the, you know, business and technology side of things to, you know, better the world. What steps did you take to, you know, execute this plan that you had created for yourself? Yeah, it was always uh, a realization I liked building things, like building things, whether that was a jump for rollerblading growing up or just in college I built a bungee jump out of a tree just like I enjoyed the process of creating something out of nothing um, I saw with computers there was a, the ability to create something new for one person could make something really impactful and so I saw that as a path where I developed my own programming skills to uh, to be able to at least prototype everything that I'd ever want to try to do. Um, and even when I had then professional career that was more on the product or business side of tech, I always kept my programming skills good enough or current enough that I, I like to say I'd never be the MBA running around looking for a programmer to make my dreams come true. Um, I wasn't good at networking or recruiting, and so it was a lot easier for me to just do it myself. And so that hands-on do-it-myself piece is kind of how I hopefully position myself to then understand how, how the world works at a fundamental level. Is, is it true that you used to program TI calculators? It is true. Is that, is that in high school? I, it is in high school, was yeah. That a, was that a business? or was It, it was not a business. <laughs> there was no good distribution. You had to like <laughs> connect the calculators together to, uh, to share programs then. Yeah. Was it one of those like a TI-89 ones where you can like actually like scroll through it? And I'm going like to date myself, but it was TI-82. <laughs> Ooh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. I remember TI-83. Yeah, mine was an 89. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, like chemistry class. I remember I would put like all my notes in yeah. there because it's just <laughs> way too hard for me. Kids. I admit I cheated Kids mom. in your TI-89s. <laughs> yeah, yeah no. Nah, uh, TI-83s came out somewhere along the way. But I had an 82 right. and um, started playing around. Initially was exposed to like – other programs that you could actually try to make, like my first programming language was actually on TA-82 and made a bunch of games for my own amusement or maybe my brother's. And like, hey, look what I made. Right. I made everything from choose your own adventure to very primitive graphic things using like printing to the screen and timing delays. Of, I'm just going to do random math to slow it down so it happens at the right refresh rate and stuff like that. So very hacky and not good form, mm-hmm. but learned a lot. Ryan, one thing you just mentioned earlier was how you were the build it yourself. You didn't rely on others. You weren't necessarily, or, you know, I don't know if you are now, but you weren't necessarily a good networker. You know, a lot of people I think, and I think Patrick and I always see this, struggle with, you know, they have this vision they have an idea, they think they know how to execute it, and especially in this tech space, they don't know how to build it. Mm-hmm. Um, for you, was 
was it the opposite problem where, you know, you knew how to build it, but you didn't know maybe perhaps how to turn it into a business? Um, I don't, I don't know if I'd go that far. I do have an MBA right. and stuff like that. Right, so, right. Um, but to me, the biggest step toward barrier toward execution is taking that first step. And a lot of times, like doing something that is unlikely to work, but gets you one step closer to having information about what you should do next, um, can overcome that paralysis of starting. And so I, when I was a lot younger, I'd come up with a grand master plan of how the world could be and what a product should be, and spend a lot of time architecting every single piece of it, and launched a bunch of companies in the, or products in the past that it was, okay, if this all came together, it would work, but... Um, what I found as I got older and tried doing this a few times is sometimes just doing opens the door to something that you wouldn't have thought of if you're sitting around right. thinking about it or even talking to people. Um, and so th- there's a lot of things that trying to build something changes your perspective on the world in a way that's unpredictable, but ultimately required to get where you are. Tell us a little bit about um, your undergrad college experience. What was that kind of like? Did you have an entrepreneurial mindset back then? Or were you more, fo- more so focused on learning something else? Yeah, no, I've always liked learning everything at a fundamental level. So my core college education was in engineering. Um, in that, I did operations research and computer science, which is kind of, I, I joke a little bit, but a precursor to big data um, back before computers could mm-hmm. do the big part of that. It was a lot of optimization algorithms and process optimization and things like that. Um, but really using computers as a tool to solve hard problems is kind of where that was. Uh, but my favorite classes were ones that were even more or less connected to that. So within the computer science curriculum, um, working in assembly language and designing chip hardware um, to implement logic. And it's kind of given me like, okay, if I understand how the chips work, I can build up from their right. type of understanding of computers. And seeing how that worked, I've kind of applied that to a lot of other parts of life of if you can dig down to the root truth um, and understand how that works, it makes it a lot easier to understand the nuances as you start to build systems on top of that and without that fundamental understanding for me it's really hard to mm-hmm. to do yeah. anything so it sounds like even back then you were like a big picture thinker like you saw like if i could just understand this i can create that and the possibilities you know of creating whatever i can create what was like why did you decide to go get your mba like why did you um what what did you think that that was gonna do for you and did it end up yeah so uh, two things um so I, so I ended up getting an MBA at MIT. So I was in Boston at the time. And it was a place where people were sitting at that intersection of business and technology, mm-hmm. trying to find out what interesting things you could do using the technology, not just um, having new innovations that sit on the shelf, but really finding applications for it. So the, the environment there made a lot of sense for me. I also thought it was one of the only things that regardless of how far you went in your career, if you're 65 year old CEO of uh, General Electric, like your MBA is still a credential that matters somehow. Um, it's kind of the only thing mm-hmm. you can do in your 20s that stays with you indefinitely and um, opened up a different set of worldview and kind of seen how a lot of the venture side of the things worked. Um, I was fortunate to work in venture capital for a little while. Back then, there was a lot less information talked about in the industry. It was very much a black box. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't have people blogging, telling all of the insider secrets. Mm-hmm. You didn't have podcasts. You didn't have all of the ways to get information about how the system worked. And so um, the chance to maybe see behind the curtain there to understand it so that I could I, I knew that that would be an important part of building things in the future, so understanding it from the inside was important. Is that what you did after uh, your MBA? You went into venture capital? Not directly. Um, I interned for a VC firm during business school. They were raising a fund while I graduated. 
it took longer to raise the funds than it took for me to graduate. So I ended up working at a portfolio company in the semiconductor space for about a year. And then they finished raising the funds a couple of weeks before the 2008 Mm -hmm. market collapse. Um, And it was a really interesting time to to be in venture capital because it was... uh, very scary times for the world economy. It's mm-hmm. like it's easy to forget now what that felt like, um, but it was. We didn't know what the future was mm-hmm. going to be. Now sitting in 2018, ten years later, it's clear that uh, the markets have recovered a lot right. faster than people thought, and it's you know, good times. But that that timing has actually shaped a lot of conservatism in my thinking on yeah. like this this won't last forever it sounds like you had a bit of a strategy going into working in a venture capital firm right out of college um why did you decide to leave ultimately um a couple things one uh my ex-wife got a job in california and uh so we had moved out here and uh i was flying back and forth to Boston, working for the VC firm for about a year. And then we uh, we had our first child, and that was no longer a viable commuting strategy. So we decided California is a great place to And did to you get live. into VC here, or did you do something else? No, here, actually, uh, first job I had after that was working in the digital strategy group at the LA Times. Mm-hmm. So kind of a big company, opposite mm-hmm. point of view. But it was uh, the media inter- industry is being shaken up by technology changes and it was a chance to see um, how how bigger companies thought about that larger organization and see if there was anything I could do to, to help um, turn, turns out I couldn't figure it out either <laughs> <laughs> Ryan just to clarify what year were you did you officially move to LA uh, 2008 or nine kind of so right in, in, the, in the in the heat of the you know of the economic Actually, kind of like 2000, yeah, yeah, eight, nine, yeah. somewhere in there. I also saw that you, and I can't recall what years it was, but you started this digital camera rental company. I did. That was the first. Uh, th- that was in LA? That was your first stab at. No, that was, uh, it was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, it was my first product idea that manifested as a, an actual company. Right. It generated real revenue, had real, <laughs> real customers. Um, it was, yeah, so the, the company was called Ushoot, and back before Facebook existed, actually started the company a few miles down the street from Facebook. Uh, should have been hanging out with those guys instead. Right. <laughs> Hindsight's twenty twenty. <laughs> um, but the there was a challenge sharing photos back then. Um, you'd go to a big event like a wedding, and even if a few people had cameras, there was no good way to share them after the fact. And so we saw an opportunity to rent digital cameras for the event instead of uh, people use cardboard disposable cameras on reception tables to mm-hmm. get candid pictures. Um, and so we'd ship boxes of digital cameras all over the country. People would use them at their wedding or corporate event, and then we'd host all the pictures afterwards in one place. And uh, ran that company for several years. Um, learned one key oversight along the way. Um, the unit economics of the actual business were phenomenal. So, uh, we'd get paid 30 days before we shipped the cameras, and like it, we'd rent them at prices that were very profitable. Um, the problem was customer acquisition costs, and specifically the cash flow timing on that. Um, people are planning a wedding 8, 12, mm-hmm. 18 months in advance right. of the wedding. So we'd spend our marketing dollar to get them interested a year before we actually collected it, even though it was before we sent the cameras. Yeah, um, so your retention was actually like your acquisition at that point. Yeah, so. and so we and we, we didn't raise money for it, and so we'd funnel money back into user acquisition, um, but it, we wouldn't see that cash for quite a while. And so it grew at a very slow rate, and yeah. I'd always kept other employment uh, or business school or whatever alongside that. Your, your LinkedIn says you're founder of multiple failed startups. Can you tell us a little bit about what else maybe uh, started? Uh, yeah, I started a bunch of stuff that didn't work. <laughs> um, Actually, it's funny enough, on, on the car right here, I was telling Pat, and I mean, it kind of makes me look bad, but it's okay. Um, I was like, yeah, I think Ryan started a company called Failed Startups. <laughs> and Pat's like, 
what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, it's, it said founder. Of no, first he's like, have you heard of that company failed startups? I was like, no. <laughs> he's like, yeah, Ryan started it. I'm like, are you sure? Like, it just doesn't mean he started. So anyways, yeah. I mean, I thought, well, back in the original dot com, there was dot com. There was a f company uh, dot com. Okay. I don't know if you guys remember this. <laughs> no. It was there was the explicit version too, but it yeah. was chron- chronicling the collapse of the original dot com. It was like <laughs> Cosmo laid off fifty employees and like all this mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but no, Phil Syrups, that's actually a good name for a VC fund. Somebody should. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. That, that's that's honestly why I thought it was a. Uh, because I saw that you had the VC experience. I was like, maybe he was like an incubator for these failed startups, which I think is a great idea, by the way. <laughs> Don't take it, anybody on the founder. Um, and I thought that you did that for like, what, a couple of years or, you know? Yeah, so, so I was at the LA Times, and uh, they one day laid off uh, 35, 40 people in LA on the digital, in the group that I was mm-hmm. in. And moved a lot of that back to Chicago. Was LA Times? They got bought out, right, by the LA Chicago Times. Yeah, Tribune, Tribune owned now Tronk uh, owned uh, the LA Times. That's had its own set of really interesting <laughs> stories, but we're, yeah. we're not going to we'll leave those out of this. Um, but yeah, so I was laid off and kind of forced into full time entrepreneurship, or given the opportunity to. Um, was in a position where, like, all of a sudden I didn't have a job and started, I had some ideas and it's actually when I first started working with George, uh, co-founder for Honey, was, uh, had brought him into the LA Times to help sell uh, Daily Deal. Uh, so we were building a Groupon competitor inside the LA Times, but um, nobody, in, nobody internally sold to that type of merchant anymore. So there was... Restaurants and local businesses were no longer advertisers mm-hmm. in print newspaper. And so I got George to come in and source a lot of these deals. And afterwards, we decided, hey, let's see if we can do something in and around this space. And we iterated on a handful of variations on on that type of market space before ultimately realizing that they weren't going to work mm-hmm. for whatever mm-hmm. reason. So we tried take that sort of model, wrap a subscription around it, didn't work. Um, and yeah, there's a few stops and starts along the way there. Um, but each time you learn more about what what it's going to take. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing in hindsight, then having launched Honey like a year and a half plus later, is with Honey, it was the first time out of the gate that it was very clear that we were onto something. It's so like the product when we launched it, we had given the product to a bunch of beta testers on Amazon's Mechanical mm-hmm. Turk. And they're like, hey, we've got this product. Um, we hope it works. Test it out on three different stores for us. This is before the holidays, 2012. And one of the guys actually posted it to Reddit. Um, we weren't ready to launch, but on some random subreddit, we ended up with a thousand users and wow. we're the top post in that channel. And as people often do on Reddit, the next day somebody cross posted it to another channel and we got another couple thousand Spiral. users. And yeah. we're like, oh shit, this is what it looks like when something's gonna work. If I knew this years ago, I would have canned all those things a yeah. lot faster than we <laughs> right, did. Yeah. Have right, a right, lot right. less scar tissue. But Ryan, I know you mentioned George a couple of times, who's your co founder. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get get into, you know, honey and how that began, how how did you meet George? So I met George when I was uh, flying back and forth across the country from Boston to L.A. and met at Caltech on one cold for L.A. Uh, Saturday morning. I don't know. Like so like 70. 70 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> 65. Yeah. yeah. There, there was two on the grass maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we, Caltech for whatever reason, have an event cross hosted with MIT. And uh, so that's why I went to it. But George had never been to any networking events, he claims. I kind of believe him. Um, <laughs> and we were just kind of not, not very good at reaching out to meet lots of other people. But for whatever reason, we ended up spending an hour and a half talking to each other then and just... Uh, he was an entrepreneur who had never worked for anybody else in his life. So he started a bunch of companies in college and had done well enough that he had been able to continue to do this for 
since then, and that's like a decade. So, or so, so was it that day, that that cold day in LA at that networking event when you guys came up with the idea for Honey? Oh no, no, no! That was <laughs> that was uh, many years earlier. So it was we. I think we probably met three or four years before we started Honey. Okay. Um, so by the time we started Honey, we knew each other pretty well, good friends, and um, made it easy for us to go from startup concept to launch in six weeks. So how did you come up with the idea? What was kind of... Yeah, so I was... Um, we, we tell the story and it's actually accurate. <laughs> um, Verified. I was, I was buying a pizza online and was frustrated that I wasn't going to go search for a coupon to maybe save a dollar and probably not save a dollar and definitely waste my time. Um, and so I just continued to be a tinkerer, keeping track of the latest technology. And around that time, Google had done a bunch of stuff to clean up uh, the Chrome extension world. They created the Google Chrome web store and like controlled distribution of these things. And so it's like, oh, this is a pretty powerful platform. How come nobody's ever done anything interesting on it? And so I kind of had that seed in my head. And my frustration with not checking for a coupon, I'm like, I wonder if I could just brute force, try every single one. That would be kind of cool. And so she so hacked together a prototype of that um, one evening late and sent it to George. And he's like, that's awesome. Can you make that work everywhere else? I'm like, I don't know. Let's see. And spent the next couple of days working through all of the technical challenges of the core product that became Honey. And then as we started telling people about it and sharing it, it was like, even within family sets, like, oh, can I have that? I'm like, it's not even ready yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, th- th- like, you dealt with this problem of, like, you couldn't find, you know, coupons online. It was just a drag. And you built it that night. Or, like, the, that, that next Like, you built the actual prototype that worked. Yes. So, is that the same product that exists <laughs> today? Insane. Yeah. Uh, it's the core of it's basically the same. Uh, I mean, we've re-architected it to optimize it several times, yeah. and we have a much better engineering team now than mm. than me, fortunately, for all of our users. Because <laughs> if I wouldn't trust it if I did cleaned it. up the notes a little bit, maybe, but that's yeah. There's still yeah. a few fingerprint artifacts from from my original design choices in there, but they've they've done a good job of. Would you say that? I know, you know, we talk about it a lot with, you know, our networks and our friends and, you know, people always present ideas to us about, you know, how awesome would this be? And, you know, at the end of the day, we, our response, Pat and I always say, it's like, we like companies that are born out of problems that we personally experienced. I mean, um, you know, if we can find a solution that works for ourselves, then maybe we can scale it up and, you know, build it for everyone else. You know, was, you know, this coupon or discount thing, was it that big of a problem for you? Um, I, yes and no. So no, in that I'm not an avid online shopper. Mm-hmm. This is, I'm not a couponer. I'm mm-hmm. not somebody who ordinarily like does that stuff right. enough that it's major pain in your ass. Right, right. But at the same time, I'm like everybody else, it turns out, and that I, there's a sense of fairness and frustration that comes with not being willing to jump through all the extra hoops and friction that comes with couponing. And so we've been able to tap into a mass market consumer with a couponing or discounting type of product um, because the, most people are like me. Most people don't want to spend their Sunday morning clipping coupons out of the newspaper. Right. Um, most people given the option, obviously want to save money, but you have a generation of millennials and kind of everybody's shifting Mm -hmm. where you're not used to dealing with friction in any part of your life. And so to expect consumers to jump through a pain in the ass, friction heavy process at the point in time when you're trying to sell them something is, uh, it's, it's not the strategy of discounting that I think persists in for the next 10, 20 years and beyond. So you dealt with this problem, you built the solution right away. What was the next step? How did you make this into a company? Yeah, so we formed the company. We scrambled to try to get the product out before the holidays. Um, this is what year? Sorry. Uh, 2012, so five years ago. Five years ago. Um, so we launched the product just before Thanksgiving. It 
blew up on Reddit a few times, and we had tens, hundred thousand plus users like pretty immediately. And we're like, this is awesome. Okay, now what do we do? We've got a real company. Finally, something's working. Let's go up to Sand Hill Road and try to uh-huh. raise some money. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, either we are terrible fundraisers, which is a distinct possibility, um, or we're running into a a pretty bad timing. Um, so it was around the time that Fred Wilson had written a blog post about mobile first and investors by and large subscribed to the point of view that the next big innovations in e-commerce and anywhere were going to be mobile apps. And so they saw a desktop browser extension, which up until that point had been a platform, had been around for a decade. It was mostly abused by people doing malicious types of things. Um, And they're like, that's cool, but what's your mobile strategy? And uh, we, we knew that the part that made what we did on the desktop so compelling is that we could eliminate all of the extra effort um, for a consumer and be very useful at the exact moment in time we could be useful and stay out of your way otherwise. That's not conducive to building habit that you need on a mobile app. And so to get a user to remember that your mobile app exists and open it even after you've got them to install It's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. You see this in every mobile app that's not a communication app. You have pretty drastic drop-off in usage pretty quickly versus what we have on the desktop where somebody installs Honey on the desktop. They, by and large, stick around indefinitely. Um, And even if you forgot that we exist and you shop twice a year, the second it's Mother's Day and you go on to go to buy flowers, uh, honey is still useful to you, even if you forgot we exist. Right. And that's pretty powerful user behavioral change. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, the question I have is, why the name? So the name is, uh, it's, it's, it's weird because I'd started a bunch of stuff before. And every time, like, oh, what are we going to name it? And you have, like, you spend... Half Lo- of longer than you did actually building the, the platform in your case. <laughs> in, in, this case by a, in this case by a lot. But typically, <laughs> my experience is it takes weeks and you end yeah. up compromising on something that you didn't like. You guys, I think, did all right. Um, but, <laughs> but oftentimes, it's like a weird compromise based on domain availability right, and right, a whole right. bunch of stuff. And Honey was interesting one in that it came up as an idea and instantly we were just like, yeah, that's it. And it had a lot of, like, it was largely unbranded, generally positive connotation. Um, but as importantly, it was something that came up in everyday conversation in a lot of different contexts um, that we thought might help with organic word of mouth. Mm-hmm. And so somebody sees honey as an ingredient at lunch. Hey, honey. Oh, yeah, I'm going to tell you about that. Or somebody's significant other says, hey, honey, I'm mm-hmm. home. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Let's. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of uh, built-in mental triggers right. to, to talk about it. And so it was pretty quick decision on that, and uh, we, we just ran with it. So it sounds like when you went up to Sand Hill Road, things just didn't quite work out the way you wanted. What was the next couple of years like? Like, did you end up raising funding, and how long did that take? What was that time like for you? Uh, it was really long and painful. <laughs> Sorry to make you recollect that right now. But. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's fine now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a couple of years ago yeah. now. Um, yeah, so we it, it became clear that VCs weren't ready to write the check for for what we were doing. We saw the user numbers were still increasing, and we saw we had a very powerful consumer experience. And if we kept at it, we thought that we'd get to a point where we could have an interesting business. Sorry to cut you off. Was it only the fact that you guys weren't optimized for mobile or something at the time that was the reason? Or did you feel like, did they give you other feedback? Was there anything else that maybe... Maybe they just didn't like us. Uh No, no. no, I think it was... uh, mostly the mobile piece, I think. Yeah. It was mobile, but not just mobile. It was we were desktop that someday might monetize through affiliate. Yeah. And affiliate is not something that most VCs 
then or probably even now are excited to attach their name to is kind of the uh, not the favored part of the marketing channel. Because you're relying on other businesses, other people to drive. Yeah, kind of. It's it's gotten a bad name unnecessarily. Um, it's I mean, at the end of the day, if if you think about what affiliate is, it's from an advertiser point of view, you pay for results. Like yeah. ultimately, that's probably the best model. Um, the challenge is how it's been implemented in a lot of cases. But from a VC point of view, there are no large comp exits within the industry or like the mar- the multiples that companies in that space got were not as exciting as they'd like to be. Now, that's because most of the businesses that monetized that way were largely arbitrage businesses, mm-hmm. like either search arbitrage mm-hmm. or some, some other flavor of that. Do you have a list of the VCs that passed on you? Um, I don't have a list. You have a mental list? They know who they are, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ryan, for, for the listeners that, you know, I guess at this point, hopefully they've already searched what Honey is, um, or th- if they haven't used it, what was the pitch for to these VCs that you and George were giving, and maybe that you could give to our listeners as well? I mean, a lot of it's the same stuff that we're doing now. Right. It's actually kind of <laughs> interesting and frustrating and exciting that th- we've gone back and looked at the decks we had from then, and the stuff we're building today is... Lar- by and large the same stuff and there's cases where you look at it and you're like oh that we should still do that i forgot about that yeah. um we had a lot of time to think about what we wanted to do on those long car rides back and forth between la and San road <laughs> um so the pitch was from the beginning always we see an opportunity to build a brand and product that's aligned with consumers best interest shopping there's a lot of companies out there that are using big data technologies to enhance ad targeting or do things that um, help retailers, but nobody's taking a consumer first point of view. If you did that, what would happen then? And our bet was that you'd get a lot of consumers on your, using your product. And if you did that, you could create a system where the retailers are incented to um, work with consumers more efficiently. And so we, we're today building products that help retailers reach consumers with offers. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's done in ways that benefit the consumer directly as the starting point. And that, that's very different than how most companies have approached it. Um, from a VC pitch point of view, I think that was clear. I think there were just enough platform leaps of faith that um, we didn't get people passed and we're less good at selling hopes and dreams and a lot better at just delivering results. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but that just took a little while. So, so you guys were I'm sure, bootstrapping at this time. Yep. Um, is there, is it true that there was a moment where you, you had to leave the company? There is. Yeah. So I, we were bootstrapping, um, and that meant negative cash flow for my personal bank account. And I had, uh, a wife who is very supportive of that, but the uh, the problem is at some point your bank account actually does hit zero <laughs> and r- ran out of runway personally. And so I ended up taking a job at another company for over a year during that bootstrapping phase. Um, and George, co-founder, kept plodding along um, trying to trying to make it work and made an impos- otherwise impossible task even harder for him because uh, if you thought fundraising was hard originally, fundraising with a co-founder that's not uh, doesn't have the optics of being all in is close to impossible. So you were still involved part time, just I was as still much involved part time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'd still do stuff at nights, and yeah. um, but it 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 wasn't until we turned the corner of we got to a large enough user base where we could approach the affiliate industry with credibility. Um, that we weren't just some fly-by-night operation trying to steal money out of the system, which is what, unfortunately, a lot of people have done in affiliate. Um, So it wasn't until we were able to be perceived differently that we could change that. And from that point, it's been an inflection point to the upside for the company, and now we're in a position where we can deliver a lot of the product things Mm -hmm. that we've wanted to for a really long time. 
And obviously, eventually, you did end up raising, you know, your seed around Series A, and I think you're at what, Series C, you see, at this point. Mm -hmm. um, when was that moment when you did get that seed round secured and you said, okay, like, we knew this was real, we knew that we had something here, but now, you know, somebody else also believes in this and somebody else also believes in the growth of this. Um, and how was that feeling like? Um, it was good. So, uh, Mucker, uh, Mucker Capital, they, they were the first people to put money in from the outside. So we'd, we'd scrape together some friends and family money to, mm -hmm. to get by and pay for servers and that sort of thing. Never paying ourselves along the way. But um, when we had somebody from the outside start to see the opportunity that we saw, um, it also helped vouch for the company as not being like – there's some degree of suspicion, like, oh, who are these guys? What are they doing? Like, if you don't have some amount of outside validation. Um, but from there, we were able to, we kind of rolled a, raised a rolling seed round from Mucker's original investment. Um, we actually played around with a lot of other product ideas to try to reposition the optics for fundraising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it should Funny sidebar story that uh, actually I heard one of our investors talk about on a different podcast. But we we along the way built a product called Milk. It was basically honey for grocery, and uh, we were able to raise part of our seed round selling that to Ludlow Ventures, um, mm -hmm. investment firm out of Detroit mm -hmm. where I grew up, and uh, they thought they were investing in that product, and then we launched it and. Um, users were interested. The economics of the industry wouldn't work for that product to exist. And so we had to pull that product after like three or four weeks in the market. And they, they wrote down their investment to zero and they're like, fuck. <laughs> um, so it's contingent upon something. But it, we were interfacing with other people's systems in a way that the economics of the industry didn't work. Um, within digital coupons for groceries. Yeah. Long story, but in short, we had to pull the product and they thought that it was done. But we, now we're probably one of their better performing investments. So it's, it, it kind of shows how tricky it is to be an mm -hmm. early stage investor. Mm -hmm. um, but we, so we, we did a bunch of stuff to raise the rolling seed. And through that time, then we started to really flip on the monetization piece of it. Um, we found a way to communicate the value we were providing to retailers and tap into the partnerships so that we could work with them. And that really changed where we've gone. So, so at this point, uh, you know, you've, you've raised your series a and seed, seed money from Mucker and, and Lilo. Um, when was kind of that, that moment where it, like it became a real company? Like, you know, you know, I'm, I'm sure you started hiring people and growing the team. Um, when did you feel like, like, this is going to go far? Uh, to be honest, we thought it would go far from the beginning. Yeah. Um, the, the, the user response is the part that was so different. And to me, betting on a product that consumers clearly love, was it, it was up to us to figure out how to make a business out of it. And I told people at the time, like, we have uh, an e-commerce product that consumers love and we're the last button people are clicking before they decide to buy anything online. If we can't figure out how to make a business out of that, I, I should go back to MIT, give my MBA and tell them I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Yeah. Because yeah. it's uh, that real estate and that opportunity just felt so like there was no other place you'd want to have as an asset to to try to build a company. And so that gave us confidence that we would figure it out. And I think we're continuing to execute on that vision now. But so for like more from the beginning, like you knew this was going to be a product that people use. And obviously when you have something that people love and use, then it could become a business one way or another. But um, did you understand from the beginning, like how like your monetization would work and, and where all that would come from? Because obviously at some point, you know, you, you can't subsidize yourself with investor money. You need to turn a profit to be able to grow yep. and scale, um, what, what was that like? Yeah, um, for us, that was uh, learning how to work with retailers and get to a place where they could trust us and we could deliver value for them in a, in a way that they understood. 
And so about two and almost three years ago now, we, we made our first external sales hire. And um, it was a way for us to tap into that industry in a way that we hadn't been able to, mm-hmm. or we didn't know how to ourselves. Like I said, we're not good networkers, or it's not relationship driven approach to, to doing that stuff. And the affiliate channel, um, the business is there. It's, it's largely relationship driven. And so having somebody that people already knew and trusted and believed in unlock the door to having conversations that then we, we, we were always, we always had the goods and mm-hmm. it was just a matter of getting the right people to have the right conversations. Ryan, as a founder, you know, you usually, especially early on, you take on a lot of different roles, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, I mean, you built you built the product in the company, like, overnight, um, and and you kind of just ran with it. But how has your role progressed over the years, over the last, you know, four or five years? And, um, you know, what, what are you mainly working on now? Yeah, that's a good question because it's changed drastically very frequently. Um, and I think... We've, we in George and I, but really everybody have had to um, get better at everything we do at an unreasonable rate. And so actually part of our core company culture and maybe even the number one thing is building a world where, or a company where everybody is constantly leveling up um, because our company is growing at an unreasonable rate. Only people that personally grow at an unreasonable rate can keep up with that. And if everybody's doing that all the time, um, the company will be stronger. But from a personal point of view, my role has shifted. I've basically done most of the different jobs at various points in time based on biggest need. And so... We were very fortunate early on to hire a great CTO, and I stopped coding immediately. (laughs) Um, And so that became a part of the organization that I didn't have to worry about all the time, but there were other parts to worry about. And so at various points in time, we ran the growth team. Um, Obviously, in a startup, there's a lot of roles that you don't have enough enough money to have dedicated mm-hmm. people in it, whether that's finance roles or anything. So I've kind of done whatever needed to get done, whether that's cleaning off the glass table in our original office at night with George after everybody left or uh, anything in between. I've kind of taking a growth mindset towards uh, getting better at everything. Do you still get that itch to code sometimes or is it kind of... Kind of um, a little bit, although I do more at my itch is more to architect stuff at this point yeah. versus to code, and I think the engineering team appreciates that. Um, so it, I, I like to know what's technically feasible at all times, so we don't ask the team to do anything that's not possible. Um, and so having some foundational understanding of what type of architecture would be required to have a catalog of all of the world's products with real-time pricing information fed by millions of users like Mm -hmm. stuff like that um it's technically hard problems that i think we have some grasp on what we're really asking for but i don't have to write the code one thing that's really awesome about i think i think you touched upon this like really early on in this podcast um was that from an early age you were always and it kind of circles back now uh, that you were always more so focused on and, or you knew that you wanted to do something that is, you know, going to make the world a better place, for lack of better terms. Um, and it, it, you never really talked, besides about the fundraising, you never really talked about money. Like, you know, you, besides raising money and, you know, having to run this thing, during this whole time that we've been with you, you never said, you know, I knew that I was going to make X amount of money, this and that. And and, and even now from your, like, you know, body, <laughs> body language, which, you know, the listeners can't see, I mean, you were kind of just like shrugging, like you don't really necessarily, I don't want to say care about that because everybody wants to live a nice life, but, you know, c- talk to us about that. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's really interesting to just see that and hear from you about that. Yeah, to, to me, money has always been a means to accomplish things that you can't otherwise. Um, and that's 
money that the company raises or money that I would ever make personally. Um, I think we've we're we're doing well enough now that I have a sense of obligation and personal responsibility to do something with whatever comes of this. And so um, the the money part, like yeah, it's it's fuel for your car to go farther and do more things. It's not the uh, the driver and for me I've always it's it's I've always been interested in what you can do with money um, more so than it in and of itself so and I, I think George shares the same philosophy on it we've been fortunate to have a very good partnership I think uh, we've, maybe we've spent way too much time together at this point but <laughs> we're very much on the same page sometimes disturbingly so yeah so the browser extension uh, recently passed five million downloads is that right uh, or more, more than that it's more than that but yeah more than that now um, and the team is about a little over 100 people now I think we have 120 120 so um, so you guys have grown obviously a lot since since when you started um, how do you manage growth and scale from here uh, yeah I think it's part of it is trying to figure out what what pieces of what we have were important and then learn how to propagate that and this is probably the hardest thing that we're doing I'd say partly because it's the thing that we're less least skilled at is uh, the organizational growth um, one it's not normal for any human organization to grow at the rate we have we started 2016 with like 10 people um, now we have it's like two years later 120 or whatever wow. um, we'll probably double again this year and if you look back through history human groups don't do that and it creates all sorts of organizational challenges in in keeping everybody aligned um, that said we're approaching it the same way we approach solving every problem it's like first principle how does this system work and um, how can we create a create a continuously improving version of that and so that's why our core value of personally leveling up creates an environment where the right type of people that want to take on massive challenges and push themselves to their limit and personally grow and benefit from that is exactly what the company needs and so we're creating a system to find people that think like that like some people want a job where they get predictability and come in and punch a clock and, and do okay. Um, someone like that I don't think would enjoy the, the pace that we move at or um, want to stretch their own capabilities like we're trying to do here. How do you effectively manage the growth of a team, like from a people perspective? Like, um, is it, do you measure like utility per person? Like, because I know I've seen a lot of, too many early stage startups um, almost actually fail because they grew too quickly and mm -hmm. burned all the money and efficiency went down at some point and sales suffered. Uh, how, how do you look at that? Um, we don't measure in that sort of way. Um, I think compared to the size of, or the amount of stuff that we want to do, our team is too small right now. And so for us, it's been a, the challenge is grow as fast as you can while maintaining alignment and really, really high quality people. That, so such that the next hundred people want to work with those people. And I think we've done, I, I, I'm very happy with the team we have. So I think we've done a good job at that. Um, but it's, uh, it's tricky. And I, at some scale, companies start to run into challenges scaling that early stage culture. And people that loved everything about like working at a 10-person company, maybe they don't like a 100-person company or a 500-person company because there's a lot, there's, there's a different set of challenges. The people that we found most successful in it are the ones that are embracing everything about that. So we have, we have, people on our team that dropped out of college and now are managing a team of engineers like at age low 20s yeah <laughs> right and so the, the fun part about being in a fast-growing company is there's room for people to take on whatever level of challenge they personally can handle at the moment and it's exciting to see what people are actually capable of if you give them the chance ryan just to kind of wrap things up you know it's been an awesome conversation, but 
I know I want you to brag a little bit here, and I think this question will allow you to do uh, that. But and I know you probably don't like doing that, but I'm gonna no. kind of force you to. All right. um, <laughs> what what do you think, or what do you believe makes you a good founder, a good leader of a team of hundreds of people? Um, I, I I'm struggling with the uh, so I, I I wouldn't say that I'm good at that and that I think everybody can get better at every piece of what they do. I think part of it is creating enough room for great people to be great. Um, and I think also then seeing a huge picture of what's possible. Um, if you look at everything that exists in the world was created by people. So there is a set of people somewhere that decided to make every single thing about the world. And those people are no different than you and I. It was just somebody that decided to start walking in that direction. And so that is an empowering um, concept in that you don't necessarily know where it's going to end up, but anything is possible. Um, and so I think finding people that are doers um, to, to help follow in that path Hopefully we can set a vision for the future that um, people believe in and get excited about and ultimately makes themselves and the world a better place. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for the time. Uh, we're excited to see the future of Honey and, and where things go from here. Um, so thanks for joining us on the Founder Hour. Great. Thanks, thanks guys. So